Hi, this is Matthew Worley. Today is October 27, 2016. I'm here along with Wink Martindale in Calabasas, California, and we're both members of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. Also joining us off camera is Randy West, well-known game show announcer and historian who has contributed to the research for today's interview. Okay, we are uh, rolling. Wink Martindale, thank you so much for allowing us into your home and taking time to chat with us. My pleasure. Now, as, um, okay, um, for the record, b just a couple of, before we talk about your career, uh, your official name at birth, Winston Conrad Martindale, is that correct? Correct, that's right. And birth date, December 4, 1933? Correct. In Jackson, Tennessee? Yes. What are your first memories of television or probably, in your case, radio? Well, my first memories of radio are listening to soap operas on radio with my mom in the afternoons. I would come home from grammar school, seven or eight, nine years old, and we'd listen to Young Widow Brown and When a Girl Marries and the romance of Helen Trent and Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. All these 15-minute soaps that were lined up one right after the other. So I became a fan with my mom of radio soap operas, which is kind of interesting because I just recently did uh, my first soap on television. I had a little part on The Bold and the Beautiful on CBS. But that was my, uh, that would be my earliest memories of, uh, of radio. And I guess um, I'd always wanted to be a part of radio ever since I knew what a microphone was. And I must have been seven or eight years old. And the radio just fascinated me. The fact that you could talk into one of these things called a microphone and be heard on radio speakers uh, out there wherever you might be. Uh, within a certain distance and it just was fascinating to me so from the time I was old enough to know what a mic was I wanted to be quote unquote on the radio did that seem like for a kid from Jackson did that seem like an attainable goal or did it seem like something very far off no it seemed like something very far off at the time because uh, there was no television and to be on radio to me was uh, something very special and we only had one radio station uh, in Jackson, Tennessee, when I was uh, very young. Now they have several, but back then they had one, WTJS. And it was my dream to be on WTJS. And the first time I ever walked into that radio station was uh, to see a radio show on a Saturday night called Ken Calling. A guy named Ken Berryhill, who went to college, Lambeth College, there in Jackson with my sister, Jerry. He was a very funny guy, and he did this show on Saturday night, playing records and just being funny. And uh, uh, I got my sister to take me to see that show one night. So that was the first time I ever remember being inside uh, a radio studio. But uh, those were great days, and uh, I don't know, whenever I, uh, I think back on them, I, uh, they seem so distant now and so foreign to me, but uh, that's the way it was in the golden days of radio. You have said that you received Life magazine in your home as a kid, and uh -huh. that, that on some level influenced or helped you to work toward the goal of being a broadcaster. Very good, very true. My dad was a lumber inspector, and uh, he would grade lumber, and uh, we didn't have a lot, we didn't make a lot of money. But one thing that he got every Christmas, in addition to a $100 bonus in cash, was a year's subscription to Life magazine. So I grew up reading Life magazine every week. And uh, I uh, reached a point where I tore out the advertisement pages of Life magazine, and I would take those into the back bedroom of our little three-bedroom home, close the door, and pretend I was on the radio. And I would ad-lib around these uh, advertisements. And uh, it was good training for me because it taught me a little bit about how to ad-lib, although I'm not doing that well here today. <laughs> well, anyway, I, uh, uh, it taught me how to ad-lib around commercials and how to punch commercials. So it helped me later. I had no idea that it would help me that much. But it was, it was a good training ground for me. Do you have any, I think a lot of kids, uh, you know, when, especially in those years, were fascinated by radio. Do you have any sense of what the difference was about you that made it a thing that you genuinely wanted to seriously pursue and actually practice versus a kid who just was intrigued by it and went to do something else in life? Well, by the time I got out of high school, when I was 17 years old, I knew 
without question what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I had a Sunday school teacher named Chick Wingate who also happened to be the uh, manager of the radio station. By then we had three radio stations and this was the smallest, a little 250 watt tea kettle, WPLI on the fourth floor of the First National Bank building downtown. And uh, he was my Sunday school teacher at Lambeth Memorial Methodist Church. And on Sundays, I would bug him to death. When are you going to give me a job on the radio, Chick? When are you going to give me a job on the radio? You know, and I kept bugging him and bugging him. Of course, I didn't know whether I could do radio or not. But finally, one night, I'm sitting on the, you know, down on every small town has a court square. And uh, two buddies of mine from my high school football team and I were sitting on the uh, railing of the First National Bank downtown one evening, one summer evening, and uh, just before graduation, this must have been around May 1951, and up comes this little Henry J, and it was driven by Chick Wingate, little Henry J automobile, and uh, he got out of the car, he was going upstairs to the radio station, I said, Chick, when are you going to give me it? He said, damn it, come on up. So sure enough, I went upstairs, we got on the elevator, went upstairs, fourth floor, First National Bank building, went into this little radio station. He sat me down in front of a microphone, turned on a tape recorder, gave me some copy to read and some uh, AP Newswire, and I knocked it out. I knocked it out of the park. He couldn't believe it because he didn't know I'd been practicing all these years, you know, doing those advertisements from the Life magazine. So I was always a good reader. I took, I took pride in my reading. So um, he said, uh, not bad, not bad at all. He said, you uh, come down here tomorrow when you get out of school, and I'll have George Smith here. George Smith was the mayor of Jackson. He owned the radio station. He said, I'll have Mayor Smith here, and we'll have him listen to you, and if he uh, gives me the okay, I'll hire you. So I couldn't wait till the next day. And I got out of high school. I rushed down there on my bicycle, and I went upstairs, there was Chick, he was all ready for me, and Mayor Smith was there. And I did the same commercials and the same news copy. And uh, George Smith immediately said, you got the job. And uh, they paid me 25 bucks a week, and that was my beginning in radio. That was, uh, WPLI was, I think, a Liberty Broadcasting Station. That's which, right. Which is uh, another famous name in broadcasting, Gordon McClendon. That's right. Uh, what do you remember about Liberty Broadcasting? What kind of programming did they feed, and how much of the station was taken up with their programming? Gordon McClendon uh, was, to me, a real idol, a hero, because he not only owned LBS, the Liberty Broadcasting System, he had this great voice. And he did recreations of baseball games. That was when you have got the, uh, you know, the, the recreations from the park to the studio. And he would sit there with a, with a, a microphone and a little sounder of a, of, a, of a bat hitting the ball. Make, and he would recreate the, uh, the baseball game. And I thought that was, what a fantastic, and that's what we took. Uh, that's what we carried by LBS for the most part. They also did some music shows, uh, and we took a few of those, but mostly it was recreations of baseball games by Gordon McClendon, Gordon McClendon, the LBS. And uh, I remember, it's funny, interesting, you've, did, you've done your homework. That was interesting. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, LBS. And, of course, he was in business for years. He's been dead now for a lot of years. But LBS uh, made, made some, uh, that, that was in the days when, Independent networks were really and truly new, you know, because we had CBS, NBC, and ABC, and that was it. But all of a sudden comes along the uh, Liberty Broadcasting System, and that was quite different. For little stations like ours, it was perfect, little 250-watt station in Jackson to have that kind of network programming with actual baseball games, even though they were recreations. Very special. Can you give us a sense, since it was your first job, uh, what... In those days, broadcasters at little stations often did everything. What sorts of tasks did you do in that first job? Was it mostly playing records? Was it mostly hosting uh, live programs? I did everything. You know, it, it, I, I swept out the station at night. I, uh, I did news. I did uh, music shows. I can't say that I was a DJ in those days because I don't even think that term was new at that time. I was a radio announcer. And... Uh, 
Uh, I remember we had a CSAC transcription library. Uh, and on CSAC, they, they, you'd get these huge transcriptions. And that was where most of our music came from because uh, we didn't have budget for records. And that was in the days of 78 RPM records. And if we had uh, the popular tunes of the day by Eddie Fisher or Joe Stafford or Perry Como, we had to go down to the record store, Jayco's record store, and actually buy them. And uh, that got to be pretty expensive. And by the time you queued one up a few times, then you had all that s at the beginning of So uh, we had the CSAC library, and we had music by Jan Garber's orchestra and Artie Shaw. You know, it was the tail end of the big band era. And uh, that was the kind of music we played. So I played music, I did news, and because I was just out of high school and I knew all of the uh, football players and the basketball players on the, uh, on the high school team, they wanted me to do play-by-play -play football on Friday nights. So I had never done play-by-play, -play, but again, I learned by doing. Sponsored by Coca-Cola every Friday night, Rothrock Stadium in Jackson, Tennessee, or wherever the Jackson High School football team went on Fridays, I went and called the games. And uh, during basketball season, I also called high school basketball. So at WPLI and then later at WDXI, a bigger 5,000-watt station in Jackson, uh, I called play-by-play -play there too. So, you know, in those early days, I did just about everything, and I just learned by doing. How were those remote play-by-play -play broadcasts transmitted back to the station? Do you recall? Uh, by telephone line. We had a little, little box, whatever you call it, and, uh, and the microphones were hooked up to that, and then we had telephone lines that, was, uh, that were uh, put in to the press box at Rothrock Stadium. We'd hook up to that, and they would go back to the station that way. So your next station was WDXI? Next station was... Uh, uh, WTJS and then WDXI. So it went from 250 water to 1,000 water to a 5,000 water. Well, I know WHBQ was a big station for you and as far as your transition into television and coming out here. Is there anything that we should know about WTJS or WDXI or your time there that you'd like to mention? Well, when I was at uh, WDXI, I was determined to one day get to Memphis which was to me like going to New York City or L.A. Uh, I mean, to be on radio in Memphis was the ultimate. And the station that I wanted to be a part of in Memphis was WHBQ because everybody in Jackson, all the kids, listened to that station. It was a mutual broadcasting affiliate, but they played a lot of music on WHBQ radio. 560 on the dial, 5,000 watts, came into Jackson like a local. So everybody listened to WHBQ. And so it was my dream to get there. Well, one Sunday afternoon, I uh, slipped into the station, unbeknownst to my uh, program director boss, and I made a, an audition and put it on a uh, little uh, acetate. And I sent it to WHBQ program director and... Uh, thinking I'd probably never hear anything from it. But sure enough, within two weeks, uh, he got back to me and wanted me to come over for a meeting. And of course, I was, I was through the roof, you know. So my dad drove me over to Memphis. I didn't have a car. My dad drove me over, and I had this meeting with the program director and uh, the gentleman who would become my mentor, uh, Bill Grumbles, and be responsible later for me coming to California. And he was, he was the general manager of the station. And uh, they uh, hired me on the spot. They had liked my audition. They sat me in the studio, did a few commercials and some, and some news copy, and uh, hired me. And uh, I went back to Jackson, gave them my two weeks' notice. Actually, I think I gave four weeks' notice. And within a month... I was uh, uh, working at WHBQ Radio doing the morning show called Clock Watchers, which again was my dream. That was, that was the show that everybody listened to every morning while they were getting ready to go to school. And so now here I was all of a sudden doing Clock Watchers. When I went over there, I lived uh, the first uh, year 
with my aunt and uncle, Uncle Pat and Aunt Susie Barnes on Sakala Street in Memphis, uh, my mother's sister. And uh, I, uh, I was, I was, it was like an out-of-body experience. I was living a dream. Now, were you professionally known as Wink at all these first radio jobs? I was you? Winky. Yeah, I, I, uh, I grew up in Jackson being Winky Martindale because the kid that I played with in the neighborhood uh, uh, didn't, Jimmy O'Neill, couldn't pronounce my name Winston. He had a little speech impediment, and he came out sounding like Winky. Winston was Winky. I don't know how, but it was. So I became Winky Martindale, and of course, then when I got into the business and moved to Memphis, I uh, just shortened it, or I think Bill Grumbles, my mentor, suggested that I knock the IE off and just become Wink. So I became Wink, and it served me well over the years. So the first station at which you appear as Wink is WHBQ. Correct. WHBQ was a radio-TV combo when you arrived, or did TV come later? No, it was just radio, and uh, within a year after I went to WHBQ, uh, they went on the air with Channel 13 WHBQ Television. And uh, they came to me and asked if I would like to do a television show with little kids. And, of course, to be on television, I just wanted to be on the radio. And all of a sudden, the idea of being on television, now remember, this is 1952-53. Television still relatively new. But I thought, wow. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't say yes quickly enough, you know. So they came up with a Mark Forrester, uh, my program director at WHBQ Radio, uh, came up with this idea called Wink Martindale of the Mars Patrol. And uh, it was a little space program. We had six little uh, airplane, metal airplane seats and uh, six little Mars guards, six, seven, eight years old. And uh, each day we would, uh, we would, uh, I had my epaulets and my uh, shizam across the front. Of, I mean, I had, I, w I was hot. I was hot. I was the space ranger galore. And uh, we had come on, drink our Bosco and milk, and then blast off, you know. And uh, we would segue into the old uh, Flash Gordon movies, which were those uh, 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 B-movie serials from S Saturday afternoons that they used to play between the feature pictures. And we'd play about five or six minutes of that because we didn't have, you know, reels and reels and reels. So we have to uh, use just a little bit on each half hour show. So we'd go into that, play five or six or seven minutes, come back out, and I'd interview the kids again. And uh, it, again, was, uh, was a great uh, learning experience for me because to interview kids, I mean, Art Linkletter said it, you know, kids say the darndest things, and they did. One time I had one get up and said, I got to go pee right in the middle of my interview. And, of course, then it was that, was, that was pretty profound, you know. Now it means nothing. Now we laugh, you know. But it scared the heck out of me. <laughs> I didn't know how to handle it. But it was great experience, you know, interviewing kids. And I got to do that for a couple of years. The show, when it, it went on the air every day at 5.30 to 6, and uh, became a huge, huge hit. I mean, I was, I, was, uh, I was the Space Ranger in Memphis. Never forget the first time I ever went to uh, one of our uh, advertisers on a Saturday to sign autographs and pictures. We had them lined up around the block at Goldsmith's department store because it was the first time I'd ever uh, gone out on a, you know, a situation where, where I was going to be seen by the kids in person. You know, they just saw me on TV, a public appearance. And uh, I didn't know how to, I didn't what, what to expect. But boy, we had them around the block, and th that's when it really hit me that, hey, you know, I think I'm part of a real big hit here. And that's when, when I began to sort of feel my oats. And I remember my mom used to say to me, uh, don't ever get too big for your britches. She was one who taught me, by the way, that when you get, reach a certain point in life and, uh, and, and you have lots coming in, you got to remember to give something back. And so she, she always taught me that, to give something back, which I always tried to do, charitably especially. But uh, Mars Patrol, two years, and uh, when that cooled off, huge in the ratings every night, just number one. 
And then after it cooled off, after a couple of years, they wanted me to do another show. And so in 1954, I believe it was, when Dick Clark was huge with American Bandstand, and when every city had its own Dick Clark, I became the Dick Clark of Memphis with the uh, uh, Wink Martindale dance party, top 10 dance party on Saturday for Coca-Cola for an hour and a half. So again, that became a huge hit. And so uh, that was the beginning of my uh, television career, from radio, clock watchers, into Mars Patrol, into Dance Party, which I continued to do until I left Memphis in March of 1959 to come to Los Angeles. So during the time that you were doing radio, you were, you were doing only one television show at each point. Correct. And the radio show. Yeah. Um, According to my research, it was very difficult to confirm this with complete clarity. You, we know you for your spoken word recordings like Deck of Cards and others. I think you were doing some recording already in Memphis. Am I correct about that? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, I forgot to mention, too, that, that uh, when I was doing morning clock watchers and also doing Mars Patrol in the afternoon, I was going to uh, Memphis State College to get my degree. I had gone to Lambeth College in Jackson for two quarters right out of high school. And I dropped out because I thought, why do I need to go to college, man? I'm going to be a star. That's what I are. And so I dropped out of college. And then Bill Grumbles, my mentor, and uh, his boss, John Cleggern, talked me into going back to college. I said, you know, you'll, you'll, all, you'll, you'll always be sorry you didn't if you don't do it at this young age. And so even though I was married and already had a couple of kids at that time, I enrolled at uh, what is now the University of Memphis. Then it was Memphis State University. And uh, I got, uh, in 1957, I was graduated with a uh, uh, major in speech and drama and a minor in journalism and English. But if you can imagine getting up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, being there at 5, 5.30 to do clock watchers, and at 9 o'clock got off the air, I rushed out to do six, I was taking 16 hours at uh, Memphis State, and then I'd rush after school back down to WHBQ-TV on Madison Avenue where I did Mars Patrol. And by uh, the time evening came around, 7, 7.30, and I did my homework for school, I mean, I was completely wiped out. I don't know how I... I was young then. You know, when you're young, you can do those sorts of things. But uh, those, those, those were good times. Now I've forgotten your question. We were asking about you doing some recording in yeah. spoken word recording in Memphis. Yeah, in... Uh, 1957, right after uh, Elvis had become a huge hit and everybody thought they could be the next Elvis Presley, I was one of those. Uh, I, a, a local record company, O.J. Records, uh, a guy named Red Matthews who ran that company, came to me and because I was popular doing a teenage dance party and popular on radio. Uh, he didn't know whether I could sing or not, but they wanted to sign me to a record contract. So I thought, man, this is cool. You know, I'm doing radio, TV, I'm going to be on records, and uh, maybe I'll be the next Elvis. Well, after I heard myself sing, I knew I wouldn't be the next Elvis, but I made uh, two or three records, and uh, one was called uh, Thought It Was Moon Love, and uh, Fade to Black, and come, the record comes out locally, and it, uh, it sells a few, a few thousand records in Memphis, naturally, but... Uh, my minister in, uh, in Memphis was the same man who was the minister in Gallatin, Tennessee for Randy Wood, who founded Dot Records. And uh, Jimmy Elder, my minister, called me one day, he's a big fan of mine, uh, and I went to his church. He called me one day, he used to come down and have coffee with me in the morning. He called me one day and he said, Randy Wood's coming to town, would you like to have him on your show? to talk about Dot Records and Pat Boone and how he started all that. And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So Randy came to town, and I thought, hmm, maybe that would, should be the day that I lip sync my record on Top Ten Dance Party so he can hear me sing. Who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky. Well, sure enough, I did lip sync that record, thought it was Moon Love, on Top Ten Dance Party that day. And uh, Randy was in the studio. I uh, got the story of Dot Records and how it all started with Pat Boone and the Hilltoppers and Billy Vaughn and those people. And, uh, of course, he saw me sing. Well, that night we went to dinner. Uh, Jimmy Elder, my pastor, and his, his wife and my uh, ex-wife and uh, Randy Wood. 
And during dinner, he said, what would you think about being on Dot Records? I mean, it was like, it was like a script. It was like this plan. And it was to a degree. <laughs> and uh, of course, I, I went over the moon. And uh, make a long story short, he bought my contract for $25,000 uh, from OJ Records. And uh, he let me know that uh, he would be on the lookout for something for me to record. We won't be in a hurry. And uh, again, this was like in 1957, early 58. Well, I didn't go to California until 1959. So when I came out to uh, California being transferred from uh, RKO, by RKO, from WHBQ to their LA-owned uh, KHJ, uh, he called me one day when I got off the air doing the morning show out here and wanted me to come to his office, which was just down the street on Vine Street from KHJ, Dot Records, right next to the old Wallach's Music City. And so when I got off the air, I went to see Randy and walked into this plush office, carpet this thick. I thought, wow, this is really something. And he played for me an old 78 RPM record by a guy named T. Texas Tyler. And it was the original recording, scratchy record, from 1946, made right after the war. It was called Deck of Cards, about a soldier who used a deck of cards in church because he didn't have a Bible. The ace was one God, the deuce, Old and New Testament, and right on through the Bible. And uh, in the middle of it, I'm listening to it, and uh, I thought, wow. Who's going to, he wants me to record this? And at that time, Stagger Lee was like number one. Venus by Frankie Avalon. You know, rock and roll was huge. Who's going to buy a semi-religious talking record? But I was determined when it was over. If he asked me what I thought, I was going to speak in the affirmative. So it was over. He picked the needle up off. He's, well, what do you think? I said, Randy, I love it, man. So sure enough, we went into a studio in, uh, I think it was August of that year, 59, and the record came out in September, and it just laid there. Nothing, nothing happened, you know, I just, which really didn't surprise me because I really didn't expect anything to happen. But sure enough, Bob Clayton, top morning man in Boston, put it on the radio one morning on his show. I don't know why or how he happened to play it, but it made the switchboard lit up, light up like a Christmas tree. And it, that about two days after that, Christine Hamilton, sales manager for Randy Wood at Dot, called me as I got off the air one day and said, Winky, Winky, we just got an order for 10,000 of deck of cards out of Boston. Well, I thought, I remember my question was, is that good? She said, is that good? If we got 10,000 on, on a record of everything we put out, we'd uh, put out records every day. So... Uh, from, from Boston, it spread across the country just like wildfire. And uh, by uh, November of that year, it was, I think it went as high as number four on Billboard and Cashbox. Uh, I got to do it. I remember the, the first network show I got to do Deck of Cards on. I flew to Springfield, Missouri to do it on the uh, Red Foley show. He did a show, uh, Springfield Jubilee. And uh, got to do it on there. I remember I was on with Brenda Lee on that show. And then after that, I got a call from, uh, or Mickey Addy, our national promotion guy in New York, called Randy and said, Ed Sullivan wants uh, Wink to do deck of cards on the Ed Sullivan show. Well, you know, that was, that was really uh, an amazing thing because I'd grown up watching the Ed Sullivan show, you know, in uh, Memphis and Jackson. And all of a sudden, I was going to be standing on that stage doing my deck of cards. And I still have the, uh, you know, the video of, of the night I did that on the Ed Sullivan Show. So uh, from that, we did, uh, I did a whole album of narratives uh, called Deck of Cards. Uh, and then I did several other albums and singles. I never had one to reach that, uh, the hit proportions of Deck of Cards. I did have one country record called Blackland Farmer, which sold a couple of hundred thousand, maybe a quarter of a million. But uh, I never had much success. Uh, at uh, at records uh, above and beyond deck of cards, but that was that was an incredible period of time, because when you think about it, you know I came out to California in March of 1959. Uh, I was doing the morning show at KHJ Radio. 
we were playing sort of chicken rock, trying to compete with KFWB, which was number one, with 60% of the audience in LA at that time. I was doing my own TV dance party uh, by that summer, and uh, I make this record and it sells a million, and I thought to myself, man, I should have come out here sooner. This is easy. But then I found out it wasn't that easy. <laughs> Now, you come out here to work for KHJ, which would become a legendary station in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, you go from KHBQ to KHJ. Give us a sense of how you make the transition from Memphis to your first station here in Los Angeles. Well, I came out from Memphis, transferred to KHJ. We were, we were trying to compete with KFWB and become a music station. KHJ, up till then, was the West Coast uh, uh, flagship of the mutual broadcasting system, mutual Don Lee. And uh, all of a sudden, almost overnight, we were playing rock and roll music. The thing about KHJ was they had all these, uh, these wonderful announcers under contract uh, who were network announcers. And they had these wonderful, mellifluous voices, but they didn't know anything about, you know, what rock and roll music. But because they were under contract, they had to use them uh, on the air. Well, I was the only one in the morning. I started the day off uh, with music, and then a guy named Henry Travis would come on with this marvelous voice. I had to hear him introduce uh, Stagger Lee by Lloyd Price. You know, he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> so it was kind of, it was kind of funny. Uh, eventually, uh, they did bring in uh, other guys, but. Uh, after a year of that, I, uh, I saw that KHJ uh, radio was going to go nowhere. They, there was no way they were going to compete with KFWB. And uh, so that's when I went to KRLA. KRLA is in Pasadena in the uh, old Sheridan Hotel. And uh, they were really competing with KFWB. Uh, we had Bob Eubanks doing the all-night show, and I was doing the morning show. And then a guy named Roy Elwell came on after me. We had, we had good, some good rock jocks. And I was only there for about a year. Uh, and I decided I didn't want to do any more rock radio. And that's when Randy Wood hired me to be uh, national promotion director uh, and assistant in A&R to learn the A&R business at Dot Records. And uh, I found out I didn't like that after doing it about six or eight months. And that's when Gary Owens left KFWB mornings to go to KMPC middays. And that opened up that slot. Jim Hawthorne, the program director, called me and asked me if I would like to get back into radio. And so that's when I went to KFWB and started doing mornings. Now, in listening to what I could find of this period of your air checks, uh, the KRLA uh, work that you did, it's quick patter, it's rock and roll disc jockey type radio. It's not quite Drake style yet. It's not quite that fast and that intense, but it's beginning to lean in that direction. Uh, KHJ, the, the big boss thing, goes on the air, I think, in 65. How did, as someone who was doing rock and roll radio for other stations, how did that affect what you were doing for the competition? Because that really changed uh, rock and roll radio. Yeah. Uh, when KHJ became boss radio, I mean, it was really hot. And uh, by then, I uh, had uh, been at KFWB from... 62, uh, we'll say, until around 65. And just before I left KFWB uh, to go to KGIL in the San Fernando Valley, uh, that's when KHJ went boss radio. By then, I wanted to get out of that end of the radio, rock radio, my dream was then to work for Gene Autry at KMPC. And I thought the way for me to get to KMPC would be to work for KGIL in the Valley. Well, the Valley uh, had an audience the size of Cleveland, Ohio. So KGIL, which was 1260 on the dial, they played Ella and Frank Sinatra and the good music like KMPC did. So I took weekends, just weekends for scale to... Uh, to be on KGIL, thinking hopefully somebody would hear me uh, at KMPC and hire me. So sure enough, within a year of being on weekends and then afternoons on KGIL, uh, I got a call from Stan Spiro, who was general manager 
at KMPC and wanted to meet with me. So I had a meeting with him one night at Dick Whitting Hills Restaurant on Ventura Boulevard. And he offered me a job at KMPC doing noon to three, because Jim Lang, who had been doing noon to three, uh, Jim Lang of uh, game show fame, did uh, what, uh, do, not newlywed game, a dating game. He had decided to go back to San Francisco, his home. So that left noon to three open, and Stan Spiro offered it to me. And he said, what would you do with that time slot if I gave it to you? And I'd always had this idea of doing what I called audio biographies, where I would have a star come in, like a Neil Diamond or whomever, and uh, sit down and talk to him for two or three hours, lengthy interview, uh, and uh, then I would take that interview and edit it down to just the, you know, the main, most interesting parts, underscore it with music, instrumental music leading into a Sweet Caroline or whatever, and and uh, it would come out on the air sounding really neat. So I explained what I would like to do, and he liked that idea. And so that's what I became famous for, quote unquote, at KMPC from noon to three, doing these audio biographies. And I did a load of them, you know, and I would do at least once a week. I'd do one once a week. Because it took a lot of time, you know. I mean, it took a lot of time to do the interviews and the editing. Fortunately, I had a guy named Larry Reed, God bless his soul, who, who loved what I was doing. And he would stay there till like midnight sometime uh, with me, uh, unpaid, uh, editing these interviews. And so uh, I remember we did the life story of Cole Porter, which took me three years to complete. And uh, that ended up being three hours a day for five complete days. But I love, I read a book about Cole Porter and I became enamored with his life, <clears throat> the life that late he led. And uh, I did that sort of thing on KMPC, but that's, that's how I went from rock radio to KGIL to KMPC. And I was, uh, I was there for a total of 12 years. I'll never forget being uh, sitting in Stan Spiro's office the day I signed my contract. And you got to remember that when I was a kid, eight or nine years old, I would listen every Sunday afternoon. Uh, I had my ear in my dad's console radio in uh, Jackson, Tennessee, listening to Melody Ranch with Gene Autry. And uh, all of a sudden, fade to black and come up on years later, and I'm sitting in with uh, Stan Spiro, and in walks the man in the white hat. And it was like an out-of-body experience again. It was like, wow. And I got up and shook his hand, and, and he couldn't have been nicer. Nicest man. He was always hands-on. He loved the radio business. And they had a whole network of stations. Of course, KMPC was the flagship of, uh, of his network. And uh, he, was, he was always so nice. And I had several opportunities to sit in his office upstairs uh, across from him and hear him tell stories about uh, the movies that he made. And Pat Buttram, his, his uh, comedic right hand. Just, you know, great stories. But it was... Uh, it was really a, a, a wonderful experience because after, as a kid, wanting to be in radio and then getting into radio and all, uh, after being in Jackson for a couple of years and doing everything that needed to be done from radio play-by-play -play to music to WHBQ to KHJ to KRLA to KFWB to KGIL to KMPC, it was, uh, it, it was a dream come true, just a dream come true. Was it ever difficult to get people to come and sit for a long interview, or were they mostly willing to do it? No, they were mostly willing to do it, because uh, after I uh, uh, created this reputation for doing this type of show, uh, I had uh, no trouble at all in a market the size of Los Angeles on a station the size of KMPC, getting an artist like a, uh, from a Glenn Campbell to a Barbara Streisand to a Neil Diamond to you name it, to come in and uh, sit with me. Because it was great promotion for them. And uh, if they had a new album, or even if they didn't, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a complete 
creative review of their career. And I had a gentleman named Tom Cradiville that worked with me uh, doing research. And uh, we always did, uh, you know, research all of our uh, personalities so that when they came in, we were really ready for them. And they always appreciated that. And when it came out on the air, it came out as being, a, you know, the shows were, were really, if I may say so, well done. And uh, so it was, it was not difficult at all to get uh, stars to come in. There were some that I never got a Sinatra. He, I could never get him to come in, although I did the Sinatra story, but I did it with everybody who knew Sinatra. I interviewed everybody who was living, who, who in some way had come in contact with Sinatra. Uh, but I never could get him to come into the studio. But aside from him, he was about the only one. They're expertly produced, and when you listen to them and consider the technology of the time and what you had to work with, as far as the equipment, that they are as impressively produced as they are really is very noteworthy because I listen and I think, well, how did he, how did he do that? How did he make that transition based on what you were working with, which is analog tape and linear editing? Yeah. Can you talk anything about how you were putting those together? Well, like I said, Larry Reed, the late Larry Reed, was my engineer, and he, he loved what I was doing. And so he would work with me countless hours uh, without being paid, you know, for it, uh, just like me. I mean, they could never pay me <laughs> for the kinds of time I put in on doing this noon to three show for what I was doing. But uh, was it mostly cutting tape, though? Was it segueing music into rolling the tape in live? Was it rolling clips in live? Was it a combination of all those things? We w it was a combination of all those things. We would, uh, Larry and I, would uh, edit the shows down. And then uh, when I first started doing them, I, would, I had my own uh, turntables in my studio, although I had an engineer who did everything else. I could play my own music. When I first started, I would try to back time everything and uh, bring in the music at just the right time. And I did that pretty well. But there were times when it got all screwed up and I, uh, I got mad at myself for not, you know, uh, pre-producing these things. So we got to a point where we would pre-produce all the elements so that we, I couldn't screw it up. Uh, the music always came in just right. You know, it flowed from the from the underscoring of the instrumental uh, Sweet Caroline into Neil singing just coming in just at the right time. So it got to the point where we did all those segments. And of course, uh, being on the air three hours a day, uh, I, would, I would, as an example, play an eight or nine or 10 minute segment with a Neil Diamond. And then I would play other music from our playlist. And then uh, 30 minutes later, I'd play another eight or nine minute segment so that it carried through the, the entire show. Some, some days, the shows, I would make them uh, run three consecutive days because I would have a lot of material, like with a Perry Como. Uh, and uh, so that, that's the way we did it. And uh, that's the way they, that's why they came out sounding so professional on the air uh, because we've, it got to a point where we pre-produced all the elements, which took that much more time. Now, in this time of radio, you've already, by the time you leave radio, you've already begun and well begun doing game shows. Your first game show, I think, was local for KTLA, which was a station that many people will remember, uh, was a proving ground for a lot of shows that later went to the network. And your first game, I think, is What's the Name of That Song, which later aired on NBC under the title What's That Song. Yeah. Tell us about how you first got involved in games and how you got this first one. Well, actually, the very, very, very first game, uh, which I had forgotten about until we were talking about Andrew Jagerman earlier, Ralph Andrews came to me with a show called Zoom. Z -double -O -M. And it was a, a very simple game. It was on Channel 5, local show, never got off the ground. I think it was 13 weeks, and that was it. But it was on every evening on KTLA, and it was uh, the camera would, would zoom in close, real close up on a person, place, a thing. And then as questions were answered by the contestant, it would zoom out a little bit and keep zooming out until the contestant finally recognized what that was. 
maybe from my description, uh, you get the reason why it didn't last very long. <laughs> but uh, it always fascinated me, the idea. I think to this day it could be done in, in a modern way and, and, and perhaps become a hit. But uh, my first uh, semi-successful game show was What's the Name of That Song? Local show. Uh, uh, three guys came to me through my agent, Noel Rubeloff, uh, and they had this uh, show that was local, and uh, their name, Phelps Reeves Martin. Uh, Stu Phelps, great guy, the late Stu Phelps, uh, Jesse Martin, and uh, Jack Reeves, and they had a company with this show, and they had sold it locally with the idea, they had sold it with the idea that it was tied in with NBC, and if the local show made it, then it would find its way onto NBC. So we were on KTLA every night, and it was a music show, kind of like uh, on the order of Name That Tune. Orchestra would play or, or band would play a song, and the contestants, <coughs> excuse me, the contestants would uh, uh, name the song, and then the uh, other contestant was a star and a, and a uh, earth person and a star and an earth person. And uh, the star would name the song, and then the contestant would sing, have to sing the first two lines of the chorus verbatim, verbatim. And uh, that was the show. And uh, it did pretty well locally, and uh, it did well enough to get an order from NBC. And it was my first network game show, and uh, because TV Guide had to have short titles. They shortened it to What's This Song from What's the Name of That Song. So What's This Song lasted uh, about a year on NBC. And uh, although it wasn't a big hit, it got me started. And from that show, I just uh, moved on from one to the other. For the record, since I didn't know about it in my research, who was the announcer on Zoom or did it have an announcer? That I don't remember. But I do remember who the announcer was on What's This Song? Steve Dunn. Steve Dunn was a famous personality from the radio days. And uh, with, I'm sure you know this, but during my run of What's This Song, the uh, executives at NBC who get paid the big bucks for making the big decisions decided Wink was too juvenile. And so they changed my name to Win and knocked the K off. So for that show, I was Wynn Martindale. And I remember when Steve Dunn used to introduce me at the top of the show, sometime I'd look around and, who's he talking about? Oh, that's me! Uh, your second game, if my research is correct, is a game called Everybody's Talking, in which you are the announcer and not the host. That's is, right. If that is correct, uh, what do you recall, again, just a couple of months, what do you recall about now being a game show announcer for the first time? Well, I wanted to be the host, but I didn't get selected as the host. Lloyd Thaxton got that job, and uh, they wanted me involved in the show, and so I became an on-camera announcer. I'd actually introduce the contestants. They would shoot me introducing the contestants. So I was sort of the on-camera announcer. Didn't make me too happy, but uh, naturally I wanted to be the host. But uh, I wasn't about to say no. It was a job. It was a gig, and uh, the checks came in on a regular basis. But uh, I did that, I forget how long that lasted, but uh, I think it was about a year. Everybody's talking. Now, my research had it is a lot shorter than that, but that may be wrong. Uh, your next show, so far as I know, is Dream Girl of 67, is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. And you're back as host again, and this one runs for a while. In fact, it actually ran, I think, after you left the show. And on this show, you work with a number of other very notable broadcasters. Johnny Jacobs was announcer on this show. Uh, do you have any specific memories of working with Johnny Jacobs? Well, Johnny was a great guy to work with. I remember that. And uh, I remember that we did uh, Dream Girl 67 in 1967 from the old Hollywood Palace, where the Hollywood Palace was. And it was a daily show, sort of a daily beauty contest. And uh, John Dorsey was the director, good dear friend, who did a lot of, who directed a lot of the, the Chuck Barris shows uh, in those days. He did Newlywed Game, Dating Game, uh, My Show, and uh, The Gong Show, John Dorsey. 
no longer with us. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a fun show, and I got to work with a lot of pretty ladies. I mean, it, you, I could have done a lot worse than that. But but when I left the show, uh, I left the show to do another Chuck Barris show uh, in uh, late '67, and Paul Peterson, uh, the actor Paul Peterson, was selected to take my place. Of course, nobody could really take my place. But uh, he replaced me, let's put it that way. And, uh, and uh, he finished out the year of uh, Dream Girl 67. And I went on to do what probably is the worst show I've ever done in my life. Chuck Barris came up with this idea called How's Your Mother-in-Law? And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, people asked me, what was the, what was the, the idea, uh, the concept? I said, well, it was a problem. It had no concept. It did, but I, uh, it, it, was not, it was not my most uh, uh, favorite show of all time. Let me ask you a couple of quick things about uh, Dream Girl of 67. This was done at Hollywood Palace, which was ABC's first, and I think at that time, only color facility. Yes. So this was done in color. Correct. correct? And two other names who worked on the show, I'm not sure if they were there during your tenure or later because I wasn't able to find any tape on the show. Uh, Roy Rowan was the announcer on this show at one time. Very famous announcer from the radio days. Did you work with Roy Rowan? No, I didn't. Also, another very famous announcer, Hank Sims, worked on the show for a while. Was that again after you left? Yeah, it was after I left, yeah. Either bef before or after, I, but I did not work. I knew Hank very well, but I didn't work with him. Well, since you say you knew him, your thoughts of Ben Hank Sims or memories of him? Just that he was uh, one of the best announcers that I've ever heard. He was, he was one of those uh, iconic uh, uh, names. And it is to this day, Hank Sims. I mean, he, he was just among the best. And I'm sure, Randy, you remember that name well, too. Just, just a great, great announcer. And remembered perhaps most well for the fact that he was the announcer on many of the Quinn Martin shows, uh, the opening title announcer. For I'll tell you another announcer who uh, is, is, uh, is one of the greats with Pioneer Broadcasters, John Harlan. John Harlan was one of the guys who just, I mean, everybody wanted John Harlan to announce their show. You know, he just, he just went from one show to the next, kind of like I did with my hosting. Yes, Harlan was a, a skillful, skillful announcer. We've talked Great about voice. in some of these other tapings. How's Your Mother-in-Law? You mentioned Chuck Barris production. Follows along the same lines as Newlywed Game or, uh, well, some of the other Chuck Barris things. It's a little bit combative. It could almost be considered coarse, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, it, it involves sort of people... Uh, telling tales out of school about each other in a way. Uh, you have said that the failure of the game, you think, might have been due in part to the fact that people didn't like to hear bad things said about people's mothers. That's correct. That's right. Uh, I think for that reason, it was, uh, it was doomed for failure from the start. And I'm surprised that Chuck Barris, who was a genius in his own way, uh, didn't, didn't see that too. Because you had, uh, you had uh, three couples. You had a mother-in-law, and sitting next to that mother-in-law was a uh, comedian. And then you had another mother-in-law and a comedian and a mother-in-law and a comedian. Three sets. And the set, I remember, was uh, red, white, and blue. It was supposed to be an all-American show, you know. And uh, I remember that the uh, one comic would stand up and he would extol the virtues of this mother-in-law. And uh, then the contest was that the next comedian would stand up and extol the virtues of his mother-in-law that he was representing, but he would knock the other mother-in-law, you know, bring her down. And that was sort of the concept of the show. So it got some laughs, but it had a dark side to it by the very nature of the concept. And so I think that for that reason, it just, it was doomed to failure. Your next show, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is Can You Top This? Correct. 
And here's a show. You're a student of the history of broadcasting, as we've learned from this conversation. Here's a show with a long tenure on radio. It uh, goes back many years. Uh, this particular version, you're coming in to host with Maury Amsterdam, credited as the executive producer. Maury. Maury Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam. Yes, that's what I tried to say or thought I said. So, of the Dick Van Dyke show, very well-known comic. So, um, what was his role as EP? He's also on camera in the show. And what were your thoughts about coming in to host a show that had a long history in broadcasting? Well, that was that's one of my favorite shows, and uh, it's another show that I think to this day could come back uh, and and be popular again. It was syndicated. It was not on network. It was owned by uh, a big company at that time, Four Star Television. Uh, Maury Amsterdam had bought the rights to the old radio show, and he decided to uh, bring it to television. And it was an excellent concept and perfect for television. Uh, I was the host, and uh, Richard Dawson, even before Hogan's Heroes, uh, was the uh, home viewer joke teller. Home viewers would send in their jokes. Richard would tell the joke, and uh, and they had a, a an audience meter, you know, a laugh meter that would show how funny the audience thought it was, and then the panel of three comics would stand up and tell a joke in the same category as the home viewer's joke and try to top that. Thus, can you top this? And uh, we had, because Maury Amsterdam was who he was, uh, we had some terrific uh, comedians on the show. Uh, gosh, we had uh, Jack Benny. We had, uh, you name it, uh, Danny Thomas, some of the biggest uh, stars uh, in in the business that of, of that time uh, stood up and, and 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 told jokes. So it was. I never understood why it didn't you know do better than it did. Why it didn't have a longer run. But can you top this? Was uh, was uh, one of my favorite shows of all the shows that I did. Now your next show, I think, or at least the next big show, is Words and Music. Words and music is one that we probably shouldn't even mention because it only lasted about 15 minutes. But it just wasn't successful at all. It was on NBC, and I was the host. And uh, again, it was uh, a girl and a boy singer. Uh, and uh, I don't remember exactly what the format was, but uh, again, it was sort of in the, in, in the uh, much like Name That Tune, but uh, all I remember about words and music was that every week uh, I would come in to tape shows and they've changed the rules. All the rules were changed every week. They never could. It, it, was, it was created by uh, a gentleman who had never been in the game show world. He was a piano player, a nightclub piano player, came up with this idea and was able to sell it. But uh, it, it, just, it just never got off the ground. And it, <laughs> I never... Uh, I never uh, really could get feel at home with the show because it changed every week. 1972 comes, uh, I think, the year, and one of the big ones, Gambit. And here you work with Heater Quigley Productions and a number of people who would be as well-known for game shows as you are. Um, what do you recall about getting the job on Gambit? Well, I remember that everybody in this city was uh, auditioned <laughs> as host for Gambit, and it came down to Dick Clark and me. And for whatever reason, I won out. And I got that show. It was the first really important show, you know, for me. Uh, it was lasted roughly five years on CBS. And it was basically blackjack. You try to get to 21 without going over. And it was, uh, to, to this day, it's one of my favorite shows that I did. It was so simple, you know. But I've often felt that the most popular shows in the world of games are the simplest ones. You know, the ones that people at home can can watch and understand without thinking a heck of a lot about it. Let me ask you about a couple of names associated with that show. That's a Heater Quigley show, as I mentioned. Yeah. Very well-known game show production house. I think, is this the first time you worked for them? I think it is. Yeah. What were your thoughts on working with this famous team of producers? Well, I'd always uh, wanted to work for them and uh, had auditioned for a couple of shows that they had, didn't win. Uh, and so I won this audition, and I got to work with... Uh, with uh, Merrill Heater's wife, Elaine Stewart, who had been uh, 
a pretty big movie star, beautiful girl. She was my, my dealer. She's the one who handed out the cards. So uh, that, was, uh, that, was, that was quite, a, quite an accomplishment to, uh, to get that show. And, and to have a five-year run was, was quite something. And I remember uh, into that fifth year, uh, the producer of that show, the executive producer, came to me, Bob Noah. And uh, I went to Bob and I said, Bob, you know that show that just came on opposite us on NBC? We were on CBS. I said, I watched it. Don't worry about it. It's not, it doesn't mean a thing. And Bob Noah said to me, he said, you know, you should never say that because first thing you know, it'll bite you in the butt. And sure enough, that show, Wheel of Fortune, has done pretty well over the years. And it, it, we had 36 uh, shares uh, with Gambit for most of the five years we were on. It was a big hit. But when Wheel of Fortune came on daytime opposite us, although it never was a huge hit until it went syndicated nighttime, uh, it's, it kept eating away at our numbers. And Wheel of Fortune is the reason we got canceled off CBS. You mentioned Bob Noah, a very famous name in game show production also, and you've brought him up. I was going to ask you about him. What are your thoughts on working with Bob Noah? Well, he was one of the most, uh, uh, one of the nicest guys that I've ever worked with. And one of the most, I guess, I think Bob Noah probably taught me, he and Merrill Heater combined, taught me more about game shows than anything I ever learned uh, from Dan Enright or anybody else over the years. Just a nice guy and uh, had, a, had a feel for uh, a game, just the little minuscule uh, uh, parts of a game that you might never think of uh, that he would bring out and uh, instruct me to do. And uh, just, just one of the real pros that I've worked with over the years. One more name from that show. Uh, again, worked many, many Heater Quigley shows. He was almost the in-house announcer for them. Is Kenny Williams? You worked with him on that show. What are your memories of Kenny Williams? Just a great, great uh, uh, pro. Again, one of those announcers that, when you heard is in that period, in that time frame, in that ten-year time frame of game shows, one of the most popular uh, of all announcers. When you heard his uh, voice, you know it was Kenny Williams. And, uh, of course, we lost him, uh, sadly. Next important thing I must ask you about, of course, we all remember Tic-Tac-Doe. comes along 1978, I think, both uh, syndicated and network. And this is a Barry Enright production. I think, again, the first time you worked with them. And, again, another very famous team in game shows, but obviously a team that is remembered for the game show or the quiz show scandals mm -hmm. in addition to um, their other work. And here you're coming on to host uh, not only for a team that was remembered for the quiz show scandals, but coming on to host a new version of a show that had been implicated in the original scandals. Um, did you have any uncertainty about that or any un and lack of clarity about working for them, or did you think it was okay? No, it didn't bother me at all because they had uh, they had spent time in Canada. They were so sort of expunged from our business, and they had to go up to Canada to work for several years. And uh, when 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 it finally came time for them to get back in the business in in this country, uh, it was uh, with Joker's Wild with Jack Berry and Tic Tac Toe. And when I got the call to uh, be host, I remember that I went, uh, boy, talking about rehearsal. Uh, we were going to do a pilot of Tic-Tac-Doe at CBS. And it was also slated to go into syndication, both network and syndication. So I knew that if this was a success, it would be terrific for me as a host, financially and professionally. So... Uh, I was looking forward to doing the show, and I remember every Saturday morning, I went down to uh, Barry and Enright Studios in Century City, and uh, we, Dan Enright came down, and we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. They wanted me to get to the point where I didn't need any cue cards whatsoever, and of course, we did get to that point. I knew the show so well. And so, uh, sure enough, we, uh, we did the pilot at CBS, and uh, it went on the air, 
And for some reason, uh, I remember that, I think it went off the air on the 4th of July. I remember that stands out in my memory. But it only lasted for like 13 weeks or so. And it just didn't find its audience. That's a nice way of saying it was a bomb. It never found its audience on CBS. And yet here were all of these program directors and these program uh, managers, station managers around the country that had already bought Tic-Tac-Toe uh, for syndication beginning in September. And here it was canceled off CBS. So there were a lot of uh, station managers and program directors wiping their brow thinking, oh my God, what have we done? Because they were locked in to carrying that show in September. Well, sure enough, wouldn't you know, it went on in syndication in September after being canceled after 13 weeks on CBS Daytime. And uh, it took off like a rocket. And in the first book that came out in the, for the, the fall sweeps, it just went through the roof and never looked back. We just enjoyed a tremendous amount of success with that show. I did it for about nine years until I sold my own show, Headline Chasers, to Merv Griffin. And that's when I wanted to leave the show, and they allowed me to leave and do my own show with Merv. But Tic-Tac-Doe, of course, is the highlight of my career, and uh, it's, it's the show that most people remember me by. Mentioning uh, Barry and Enright, again, two famous producers, since you worked with them so long, can you give us a sense of these two men, of their working relationship, what their roles were, and just your thoughts on them as people in general? Dan Enright was the producer, quote unquote, and uh, Jack Barry was the businessman. Although he hosted uh, Joker's Wild, uh, which was very successful, and uh, I guess second only to Tic Tac Doe in popularity and success uh, financially and otherwise. Jack was the businessman. He took care of the money. He, uh, he, he was the one who, who uh, would go into the networks and, and pitch a show and sell it. Uh, Dan was more uh, the producer uh, of the show. He, he was the guy who handled the, uh, the uh, details of how to, how to uh, uh, create a show and, and uh, handle all the details of getting it on the air. But that's, that's the way they worked. And they worked very well together. Some people who worked for Barry, Jeff Edwards comes to mind, talked about him critiquing their performance. Did he critique your work or did he leave you alone more or less? He left me alone. I, I never uh, had much to do with Jack. Uh, we used to have dinner together a lot of times because he'd come in to watch some of the tapings of Tic Tac Doe. And uh, he would have dinner with us, with his wife, Patty. But uh, <laughs> I remember uh, about seven years into Tic-Tac-Doe, uh, I was making, uh, you know, you make more money each year. And I was up there pretty good. And uh, I found out that Jack had gone to Dan and to uh, uh, Dick Colbert, the syndicator, Colbert Television Sales, and wanted to... Uh, uh, he wanted to talk to him about easing me out of the host job because I was uh, making too much money. And uh, they talked him out of it because, you know, it's like it would be like going to Merv Griffin and say, Merv, you know, let's get rid of uh, Alex Trebek because he's making too much, or Pat Sajak, they're making too much money. You know, you don't want to mess up a good thing, you know. People get used to watching, you know, a certain host do a show. Alex Trebek is Jeopardy. Pat Sajak is Wheel of Fortune. Wink Martindale was Tic-Tac-Doe. So they talked him out of that in a Tennessee minute. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I always thought, I always remembered that about Jack, and it always bothered me, you know, that he, he had that attitude. We're getting close to the clock, so I want to just hit a couple of the other important shows. Uh, you return in uh, maybe 1980 to do a new version of Gambit, Las Vegas Gambit, taped from Las Vegas. Las Vegas had become something of a, not exactly a capital, but certainly an outpost of game show production. A number of game shows were done from Las Vegas in those years. Uh, you were still working here doing other shows, including Tic Tac Doe. What was your thought on doing Las Vegas Gambit and all on going to tape in Las Vegas? Well, I was doing radio at KNPC, and I was doing, uh, I was doing, uh, still doing uh, Tic Tac, and uh, all of a sudden Las Vegas Gambit came along, and uh, 
I mean, I was, I was, I was happy about it because I love working in Las Vegas and I love being part of the success of Tic Tac Doe. Uh, we did it at the Tropicana Hotel. And uh, I always thought that Las Vegas Gambit uh, did, again, is one of those shows that didn't enjoy the modicum of success that it should have enjoyed. Uh, we, had, we did it live in front of a, a whole room full of people in the showroom there at the Tropicana. And uh, it was just it was just great. I, I love doing that show. And uh, it's one of my one of my all time favorites. You mentioned Headline Chasers a moment ago. You leave uh, Tic Tac Doe to uh, to host this program, which is uh, one of your own creations. So it's the first I think it's the first show you sold also. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And you sell it uh, to the King Brothers and Merv Griffin is involved in this also. Again, more famous names in game show in the game show world. Um, what are your memories of working with Merv Griffin? Well, I remember that uh, Headline Chasers had its beginning with me standing in the kitchen uh, in Century Hill where we lived, reading the newspaper every morning. And it just occurred to me one day that, you know, I mean, Wheel of Fortune was uh, popular at that time. But it occurred to me that if, if you looked at headlines in the news and you filled in those headlines, that might make a game show. And so... Uh, I started working on that and creating uh, the idea, developing the idea, and I, uh, I had Michael King come over and take a look at it, and he loved it. And uh, then I, uh, he, 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 he decided that we should show it to Merv because they were working with Merv on uh, Wheel and Jeopardy. And so... Uh, we went to, uh, we set up a, uh, a run through for Merv Griffin in Merv's office one day. And uh, I'll never forget, we got, we finished with the run through. It went extremely well. And Merv Griffin came and sat on the edge of my seat, like this right here. And he looked at me and he said, This is, this is no ordinary show. This is a very important show. And so he, uh, we did a pilot, and uh, uh, the pilot turned out great. And uh, it uh, went into syndication that fall with a huge complex of stations uh, for King World. And uh, I guess the reason Headline Chasers never enjoyed more success than it did. My only reason for that that I could ever think of was it was just too difficult. It was too hard. I remember going through a, uh, Sandy and I went to on a promotion trip to Miami, Florida, uh, trying to boost the ratings uh, that fall because it wasn't doing all that well. And uh, I remember sitting across the desk from a station program director in Miami and he said something I never forgot, and it sort of summed up the reason for Headline Chaser's failure. He said, can you dumb it down a little? And I thought, can you dumb it down a little? But it was, you know, it was filling in headlines. It was, it was headlines past and present, and it was really a good show. But it was just, I guess, too difficult. The one I saw in preparation to do this, again, it's Wheel of Fortune-like. I found it a lot more interesting than Wheel of Fortune, actually. And, yeah, not quite as dumbed down. Good show, That's wasn't good it? Point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your announcer on that show, again, I, I have it running about a year, if my research is correct. That's right. right. Your announcer on that show is Johnny Gilbert, another yep. well-known figure. Your thoughts on Johnny Gilbert? Well, Johnny, it was, it was so, so much fun to work with uh, Johnny. I worked with him on uh, a, a pilot, I think it was, at CBS called Top Secret and maybe a couple of other shows. But uh, I chose him to do this show. I asked Merv, you know, for Johnny to do the show because I always thought that he had that, gosh, he's still, he's still at it for Pete's sakes. I mean, he's still going strong. And I think he's got to be pushing 90, 91. 91, and still sounds the same. But he had that enthusiasm. He had that, that voice, that perfect voice for, as an announcer on a game show. So always enjoyed working with him. Uh, he, he was just, uh, just, just the very best. 
And also another Southerner, by the way. Yes. Enough. Uh, next important show we should mention, and we're trying to hit just the last few here, I mean, obviously you have many, many shows, but some of the really key ones. The New High Rollers. Uh, this is uh, Meryl Heater, Heater not, no longer Heater Quigley, just Meryl Heater this time, has again about a year run. Uh, what are your thoughts on the New High Rollers? New High Rollers was, uh, I loved High Rollers because I love rolling those dice, and I thought the game where you eliminate the numbers, you know, was a terrific game. Uh, everybody knew how to play. It was uh, simple to play. It was fun to play. And I never, maybe I say this about all the shows that I liked, but I've been fortunate in that I've had the pleasure of hosting, I think, some of the better concepts, game show concepts over the years. And High Rollers was one of them. You threw the dice, you know, and, and uh, everybody knows, everybody, most people have been to Vegas and they shot uh, dice roll craps and and uh, you know you either get seven or eleven or you you know but the it's the reduction reducing those numbers uh, was, was so much fun and of course Alex Trebek did the first version of uh, High Rollers and then I got to do it uh, he did it with Ruta Lee and uh, it was just it was just fun it was just one of those games that that should have had a much longer run. And is another one of those games that I think to this day could come back and be successful uh, today. Another Merrill Heater show at that time, around that time, called The Last Word. Uh, any thoughts on this show? We did that in Canada, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. It was for Turner Broadcasting. And uh, it was uh, on the Turner Network, but it was, it was more like a syndicated show for us. And again, it, it, uh, it was a good show. Uh, maybe too dependent on the word, the word game, but it was, uh, it, was, it was a terrific format. Never understood why it didn't have a longer run. But uh, again, one of those shows that I truly, in, uh, truly uh, did enjoy hosting. Uh, 87 to 1990, if my research is correct, along with Barry Enright, you produced, did not host, also done in Canada, Bumper Stumpers. Another kind of a twist on a word game. Uh, what are your thoughts on the creation of Bumper Stumpers and on the success of the show? Well, Bumper Stumpers was, uh, was uh, originally called License to Steal. And uh, Mark Maxwell Smith uh, at Barry and Enright came up with uh, a better, much better title, Bumper Stumpers. Uh, I started developing that show again in our apartment in Century City. And it got to a point where I wanted to show it to Dan Enright. And he came over to my apartment and looked at it with Mark uh, one day and loved it. And uh, we were able to, uh, to sell that show uh, again, uh, taped in, in, in Canada and seen on, uh, I think, uh, was it the, uh, well, it was one of the Canadian networks. And uh, it was based on, uh, I, I, always, I always found myself pulling up behind a car and I'd try to figure out the personalized license plate. You know, and I thought to myself one day, self, this would make a good game show. And from that came Bumper Stumpers. Uh, quick note about kind of a quirky game in this period called The Great Getaway Game. Only ran uh, 39, uh, done for the Travel Channel. What, what are your memories of The Great Getaway Game? A guy named Dick Brockway came to me. Uh, that was his idea, and uh, it was taped in New York, asked me if I wanted to do it, showed me the game, and I wasn't doing a game at the time, so I did, and we went to had, had to fly to New York to tape those, and I guess we, we did about, a, I don't know, 39 weeks of games, uh, never was a big success, but again, was on the travel channel, and uh, had to do with traveling, naturally, the great getaway game, and it was fun to do. And uh, fun to be in New York uh, during that period uh, to tape those shows. But uh, again, Dick Brockway, great guy to work for, but game just didn't have it. I think the last two important games I should ask you about, uh, one, and we have Randy West here with whom you worked on. Randy who? <laughs> on Trivial Pursuit, and then it's accompanying games, Boggle, Jumble, Shuffle, and maybe one other even. Um, this is, again, a, a production of your own for Family Channel. Uh, talk to us about the genesis of this. Pat Robertson is involved. This is kind of an unusual game show package, it seems. Yeah, the Robertson family wanted to put together 
a game show package uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, Bill Hillier, my partner and I, were fortunate enough to have uh, uh, Pat Robertson and uh, his son uh, select our production company to build this uh, group of, of games. And uh, it was a series of games that you've already mentioned, so I won't go over those again, but uh, a series of games centered around uh, Trivial Pursuit. Was there any pressure on the behalf of, the, of Pat Robertson to create games that were specific to his brand or that related to a family-type brand, or was that discussed at all? Uh, I don't remember, but I just remember this, that the because in those days we were, we were so many of the games used uh, uh, people at home uh, had to call in to play the game. Uh, and at that time, this was before, uh, this was before handheld phones and, and it just cost too much. You know, the phone, the phone bill was enormous and it was because of that, that the whole idea went down the tubes, but, uh, the games worked well and, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was successful to a degree it was the expense of it that really took the, took the shows down. But they were all built around Trivial Pursuit. Interactive phone-in games. Yes. Um, last big show, although you've, you've done another show that I would say in some ways is a big show since then, but one of the last big shows that people remember as far as your work as a game show MC is Debt, 1996. Again, a very unusual in its format game show. Tell us about the genesis of Debt. Well, Debt was... Uh, I got a call when I was still with, with Bill Hilliard. Uh, I got a call one day from my agent who wanted me to have a meeting with a fella who worked at Disney called Michael Davies. Michael Davies was the producer, and he had uh, uh, come up with this idea for debt uh, at Disney. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a show where we paid off young people's debts up to $10,000. And uh, we did the pilot and uh, showed it to, we had several different networks come in and watch the live pilot. We didn't do a tape pilot. It was all live. And uh, I remember Andrew Golder was, uh, was the uh, uh, producer on that show, the showrunner, uh, with Michael Davies, who was the producer. And uh, Lifetime was one of the networks that came in to see the show, and they are the ones that bought it. And uh, it was, uh, I, thought, I thought it was a terrific show. And the first year, it did extremely well on Lifetime. But after the first year, uh, we experienced a lawsuit by Merv Griffin and Jeopardy because they felt that the format, uh, a certain part of the format of the show was too much like Jeopardy. And so we had to change the format. And once it was changed from its original style, it never was the same. And it never did have that special quality about it. And I think that in the second year, after the second year, it just went away. Two more questions about debt to wrap that up. Uh, one thing that's unusual about debt, it's not completely unique, but there weren't many shows that had a female announcer, and you did on debt. And I assume that was that request of Lifetime. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah, that's right. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to have a female announcer, and uh, I can't even remember her name, but I know she did a good job, and it was always nice working with a female. Julie Clare. Very good. Last question about debt. It has been said that debt was canceled because there were too many men watching and not enough women. To your knowledge, is that true? That's something I've never heard before. Could be true. And of course, if that were true, I can understand why it was canceled because you've got to have those women. But I don't know. I've never heard that before. Well, I'll use that as an excuse from now on. <laughs> okay. In bringing all this to a close as we're, we're getting close to our time, let me ask you just a couple of odds and ends here. Uh, you worked for so many of the big game show companies and big producers. You were a guest on some Goodson Todman shows, but to my knowledge, you did not work for them as a host. Did you ever audition for any of those shows? One show. 
I auditioned for one Goods and Todman show. It was called The Better Sex. And you know who ended up getting the host job on that? Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson, the country singer. And Sarah Purcell. And Sarah Purcell. Uh, and I, uh, it was the only show, I don't know why, but I, I knew Mark Goodson. I never knew Bill Todman. But I knew Mark Goodson only socially. But for some reason, I never, uh, maybe he wasn't a fan of mine. I have no idea. But that was the only show that I was ever called in to audition for at Goodson Todman. You say maybe he wasn't a fan of yours. Obviously, a lot of people are because in addition to your game show credits, you have scores of credits in which you appear in television shows or films, more or less playing Wink Martindale. Interestingly enough, when producers want to cast a game show host, so often, in fact, almost always, the person that people seem to think of who sort of represents, typifies the idea of the game show host seems to be Wink Martindale. And Wink you've Farthingdale. Had, <laughs> you've had an <laughs> awful lot of success, or at least done a lot of work, appearing as yourself in commercials and TV shows. What do you think it is about your image or your work that is, for so many people, called you to mind as the sort of archetype for the game show host? I think be mainly because of the name. I think the name was so unusual, it really worked well for me over the years. Thank God they changed it from Winston to Winky to Wink. Uh, but I think the name is the main thing. And the other thing is that when Tic-Tac-Toe was extremely popular, uh, it was at a time before we had 150 or 200 channels. You know, every, every night we were, we were one of the first with Joker's Wild, if not the first, to go into that prime access time slot. Uh, later came Wheel and Jeopardy. But we were the first, Joker's Wild, back-to-back -back with Tic-Tac-Toe, uh, 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And uh, uh, because we were so popular in that time period, and there weren't a lot of different channels that you could go, now, you know, there are channels for everything. There's a, but, but in those days, you had Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, uh, 9, uh, 11, and 13. That was about it. So because of the extreme popularity of Tic-Tac-Doe and the unusual nature of my name, Wink Martindale, I think that's it. I know that on The Tonight Show, i uh, tell you a little story. Johnny Carson, they, every time they wanted to do some sort of game on The Tonight Show, they would use an offshoot of Wink Martindale's name. And uh, some of them were pretty funny, like one I gave you was Wink Farthingdale, you know. Some of them were worse than that. But uh, one night, Sandy and I are in a restaurant in Beverly Hills, and Johnny Carson has finished his taping of The Tonight Show, and he's on his way home to Malibu, and it stopped in this same restaurant to have a bite to eat. He was sitting by himself over in the corner. And Sandy and I were across the room, but Sandy saw him and she said, you've absolutely got to say hello to him because they've used your name so many times and I'm sure that he would want to say hello to you. I said, I'm not going to bother him. I was always, Sandy's always felt that I was too much that way. I don't want to bother people, especially when they're having dinner. But she kept on me and kept on me. And sure enough, when he got up to leave, uh, he got to the front door of the restaurant and I went up to him and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Mr. Carson, excuse me. And he turned around and he said, wink. And he couldn't have been nicer. And he said, I hope you don't mind what we do with your name sometime on the show. He said, we just, you are the quintessential game show host as far as we're concerned. And your name is perfect. And I said, no, I said, I feel honored that, you know, you'd want to use my name. Point being, he couldn't have been nicer. And uh, I'm so glad that Sandy talked me into getting up and going to say hello to him before he walked out that night. Otherwise, I would have never gotten to meet the man. For point of reference for history, do you happen to recall the restaurant? Uh, Sandy would, but I can't recall the name of the restaurant. Sorry about that. It's okay. Randy, do you have any name, any personality, any show about which you would like to ask that I have not mentioned? Not necessarily a show, but I'd like 
like to go deeper into uh, the personality and work my, uh, style of uh, Meryl Heater, and whether you found uh, Barry and Enright as two gentlemen to be, uh, uh, had they learned their lesson? There's some who say that uh, Jack Barry was still manipulating James Lake. That joke is wild. You mean manipulating fixing? Uh, choosing questions that were easier for some contestants is uh, merely a rumor, but it's been said several times. Never heard that about him. Yeah. Uh, How about their, their morality and deal, doing business with them? The two companies that come to mind when I think about those for whom I've worked over the years naturally are uh, Barry and Enright, Jack Barry and Dan Enright. Nice people to work for. I never felt close to Jack Barry. Uh, he was, as I said earlier, he was the businessman of the two, but he, he was hard to get to know. He, uh, he just really was not that personable a person. Dan Enright, on the other hand, long after Tic Tac Doe uh, had gone by the way, uh, he and I uh, were very uh, close friends and had dinner on many, many occasions. So I felt very close to Dan Enright, and he taught me a lot about the game show business. Uh, the other company, of course, would be Merrill Heater and Bob Quigley. Bob Quigley, I didn't know all that well. Bob was, uh, was uh, uh, the lesser half, quote unquote, of that team. Uh, I'm sure he had a lot to do with the uh, uh, creation and development of a lot of their games. But Merrill Heater was, to me, uh, one, of the, one of the real uh, geniuses in the world of, of game shows. He was so sharp, and he, again, knew exactly what needed to be fixed in, in a game uh, if, something, if something was a little wrong or a little off here or there. So I enjoyed working with uh, Merrill Heater, and to this day, feel very close to Merrill. Anything further to pursue on either of those lines? Did that sort of give you an idea? Yeah. But that other part, I, I, didn't, I, I really didn't know, so I couldn't answer that. Uh, in coming to a close, uh, we're here doing this on behalf of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters as part of uh, an extension of the work originally begun by Les Tremaine on audio tape many years ago. When did the PPB come into your life? Who was your original sponsor? Do you recall what year you joined? All those things. I don't remember uh, the year that I joined. I, I feel like I've been with PPB forever. But Art Elisi was uh, my first uh, sponsor at Pioneer Broadcasters. And uh, I have received both of their awards, which I appreciate very much and value. PPB is one of those organizations that I think is so important to all of us who have been in uh, either radio and or television. There's, uh, there's so much uh, uh, in the way of uh, memories of radio that, uh, that comes back to me every time I go to one of those, uh, one of those meetings. And I've had the pleasure of being on the dais uh, on several occasions for those being honored. And uh, of all the organizations that I'm a part of, I, I put that right at the top of the list. The last question, is there anything you would like to tell us about which I have not already asked you? No, I think you've covered just about everything. Uh, thankfully, you've left out uh, some of the worst game shows I've done. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of bad ones, too. But... Uh, you know, it's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful career. I, I feel so blessed to have been able to be a part of both radio and television. I knew what I wanted to do from the time I was this big. Uh, I got to do it in spades. Uh, and I, I, I just... I think there's probably, if I may say so, there are very few people in this country who don't know the name Wink Martindale. Uh, not that that's all good, but uh, it's nice to be known. And it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to, 
to get up and go to work, so to speak, uh, over the years uh, doing radio and or television because so many of us get up in the morning and we shave, we take a shower, we get ready to go to work, and we go to a job that we literally hate. We don't really like what we're doing. And to do something that is so special and to do something that you do that you always wanted to do and still enjoy doing to this day, uh, as I say, I feel very, very blessed. Wink Martindale, thank you for allowing us into your home as you've done so generously. It's lovely and allowing us this time to talk. Thank you. My pleasure.